Can anybody guess the title of this sermon? <laughs> you are needed and needy. And that's one of the things I want us to understand as we get into this sermon, as we read this passage, as we think about it, is that's a truth about ourselves. You are needed, needed, and needy. If you were on a desert island, something like that, wouldn't it be great? What would be your greatest desire if you were on a deserted island? I say, so stay there. So, well, yeah. <clears throat> I think your greatest desire being on a deserted island would be to get rescued. Uh, you know, by whatever means. You'd be finding the bottles and flinging it in. Even if you had everything else you need, your real desire would be for other people. Because we really do need one another. Now, the point of the message is this. As one to whom God has granted faith, you are needed, and you desperately need us. We're going to look today at some truth. And in Romans chapter 12, verse 3, we're going to see a truth about ourselves. And then verses 4 and 5, a truth about our place in the body of Christ. And then in verses 6 through 8, we're going to see truth about our gifts. If you'll follow along, Romans chapter 12, we're going to read verses 3 through 8 this morning. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather to think of yourselves with sober judgment. One translation translates that with sound judgment. Same idea. In accordance with the measure of faith God has given you, just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. And many times in this passage, in fact in verse 3 and verse uh, 6, when he talks about grace, it might be accurate to translate that as grace gifts. Because that's what he's saying. He's saying, uh, have you ever heard of the word charisma? Yeah, forget that one. But it's the word. But the meaning is the idea that you have a gift that God has graciously given you that you did not have before. It's a faith gift. It's a gift given to you by grace. That's what he means. So we have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it's serving, let him serve. If it's teaching, let him teach. If it's encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. And if it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. Let's bow together in prayer. <clears throat> Fathers, we come now to your word. Lord, we've read it. And Lord, we're going to think more deeply about it. We ask, Father, that your Holy Spirit will open up our hearts and minds that we might understand it. And understanding it, Lord, that you'll also, through your Spirit, Show us how you want us to use the abilities, the gifts, the talents, whatever it is, Lord, that's a gift from you in order to serve the church. And Father, we're thinking not just about this church, but about the church, that company of believers all over the world. Lord, some who are concluding their Sunday morning services, some who are just getting ready to start Sunday school, Lord, some for whom it's already Monday, but they've already been through a Sunday of worship and serving you. That Father, we have a role to play and a ministry in that church. And Father, we ask that you'll help us to see our place and get busy about doing and using and working and learning. We ask this in Christ's name and for his glory. Amen. Some kids decided to form a clubhouse, and they thought, well, you can't have a clubhouse without rules, and they came up with these rules. Nobody act big, number one. Number two, nobody act small. 
And then number three, they said, everybody act medium. Well, that's kind of what we're talking about here. In verse three, he's telling us, let's not act big, let's not act small, but everybody ought to act medium. You ought to act according to the reality of our situation in grace who we are in grace. Verse 3 says, For by the grace, that is, the gift that God has given me, Paul says, I say to every one of you, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought. We should not think that we're better than we are. Peacock was what I thought of. Strutting around, showing. You know, now there are some people that the worst possible thing for them would be to be up here. Even if they had to sit up here. Like say, if we had a choir, if we have a choir, that, no, I, I don't want to be, all them people looking at me. You know, it's kind of like, I don't want, there's other people that are just craving attention. You know, they come into the room and they, they really want attention. For whatever motivation, one way or the other, we need to recognize that we should not think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. We're important, but we're not that important. A preacher one time asked his wife after a particularly good sermon on the way home, he said, how many great preachers do you think there are in the world today? And she replied, probably one less than the number you're thinking of. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you can get a little elevated and think, man, that, that went really good. Boy, that was great. And you're thinking, well, no, not really. Uh, recognize that you're not that great, you're not that small, you're probably just medium. But God has given you certain gifts, and he has been gracious to you. He says, instead, I want you to think, verse 3, think of yourself with sober judgment. That is, with a sound judgment. Be honest, the NLT says. Be honest about who you are and what you've got. It does no good to exhibit false humility. Uh, sometimes when people will sing, and I'm familiar with that realm, you know, and people come and say, oh, that was really, oh, that wasn't really much. That was, you know, I'm, I, you know, things, you know what you're looking for? More compliments. Yeah, <laughs> please, please tell me more. You know, instead of recognizing, well, okay, I can sing baritone. That's not a statement of pride. That's just a statement of fact. That's my range. I can occasionally hit bass notes. I really miss George Bird. Because George, George could hit the low ones. And say, right, George, that one's yours. I'll just, I'll look like I'm singing, but you know, it's not, what's coming out of me is not going to be very loud. Uh, but recognizing what you have. I'm not a high tenor. I've even lost through the years my head voice. I just can't yodel like I used to. You know, you lose some of this. You have to recognize, okay, be honest about what you have. You know, this calls for a sound appraisal. What abilities, what gifts, what has God given me? Uh, what do you enjoy doing is one way of looking at this. Think about what you like. I like doing this. Well, you like doing it. Do others like you doing it? Well, if others enjoy, if you like doing it, and others enjoy you doing it. They think it, you're, you're good at it. You get positive feedback on that. Then, okay, you, you're probably that. You're probably well on your way to figuring out what it is God has given you to do. I like doing this. Because a lot of times, if you like doing something, you eventually will be good at it. If you really want to do something, you know, unless you just absolutely don't have the ability to do that, uh, you will eventually learn how to do it. You'll put in the effort, you'll take the voice lessons. By the way, if I ever tell you you ought to take voice lessons, don't take that as an insult. That's a compliment. I think it would be worth the money. If I didn't think it was worth the money, you know, I'd tell you don't waste your money on voice lessons. You know. uh, but be honest. What ability do I have what do I like doing? What do other people seem to indicate that I'm good at? And then go after developing that. Try to be the best at it you can be. Try to learn as much as you can to be able to do the things that God has given you to do. That's sound judgment. 
But in order to avoid getting the big head, we need to measure ourselves. And notice what he says here at the end of verse 3. In accordance with the measure of faith, God has given you. Now, what in the world does he mean by measured yourself by the gift of faith? Well, in studying this, I came across three likely or possible uh, meanings for this idea of faith. Number one, the most common interpretation, or one of these three most common interpretations is, is, is miracle work in faith. You know, God has given you this ability, and you heal people, you do miracles, you do whatever it is, by the amount of faith that God has given to you. If you've got a lot of faith and you do great things, that's one possibility. The second possibility is the faith to believe God's promises. Now, there is a gift of faith. Some people just have the ability to believe God. I mean, it's just they can believe God for great things and God supplies that. And, it, you know, the Bible talks about, in 1 Corinthians 12, talks about this gift of faith. And there are people that I've met that have the gift of faith. That's their gift. They're really good at it. And uh, we learn from them. But is, does he mean here that we have faith to believe God's promises? I, I want to suggest to you that both of these are wrong, and here's why. Because either one of these definitions would not encourage a church to draw together. It would encourage people in the church to be proud of what they've got. Uh, for instance, I have greater faith than you. If you had the kind of faith that I have, you could do miracles. Do you see the division there? What's, what are you lacking? Well, you don't have enough faith. Jesus said if you have the faith as a mustard seed, you know how big a mustard seed is? About that big right there. See how big that is? I could be holding a mustard seed right here and you wouldn't know. It's that small. And you could move mountains. I have met almost nobody that has that much faith. Because if they could, they could move a mountain. It doesn't take much faith. That's not what I think he means in accordance with the faith that we've been given, that God has distributed to us. I think uh, the, the commentator... Uh, Cranfield is right in Romans when he wrote this. This faith is a standard of self-measure, namely our ability to believe. Now notice, here's the next part, the important part, which is given to every Christian and which is precisely the same for all fellow Christians. How'd you get in the church? Well, you weren't born into the church. You didn't join the church. How'd you get in the church? The only way any of us get in the church is when God gives us the ability to believe Him. That Jesus Christ died on the cross in our place. He took our sin upon Himself. And God accepted that sacrifice and raised Him from the dead. When, we, when God gives us the ability to believe that, we're in. Because when we believe, the Holy Spirit of God places us into the body of Christ. Remember chapter 6? We talked about the baptism of the Spirit. When God gives you the ability to believe, if you're in the church, if your faith is in Jesus Christ, you've got exactly the same gift that everybody else in the church got, the ability to believe. I think that's really what he's saying here. It fits with the, the concept of faith. And Cranfield goes on to say this. Let me read this for you. It's a standard which forces us to concentrate our attention on those things which we're on precisely the same level as our fellow Christians rather than on those things in which we may feel superior or inferior to them. For the standard Paul has in mind consists not in the relative strength or otherwise of the particular Christian's faith but in the simple fact of its existence. We're all on the same level here. God may have given you a different gift than I have, but he's given us all the same gift, the gift of faith. And as long as we have faith to believe in God, we're qualified for the table. Because we recognize the only reason we come to the Lord's table, the only reason we are able to be a part of the church is because God gave each of us the gift of faith. It manifests in different ways in terms of other gifts, grace gifts and abilities, but that's God's choice 
not ours, Paul is saying. Now this would fit what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10, 12. We're going to put that up so you can follow along. Paul says, we do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. He's talking about those who claim to be great apostles and claim that Paul wasn't much. He says, when they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they're not wise. That's not a wise way of looking at things. We have faith. We're in Christ because we needed to be in Christ, otherwise we'd be lost for eternity. God would justly have put his wrath upon us, save for the fact that he gave Christ and he gave us the gift of being able to believe in Christ. That gift of faith sets everything up on how we're going to do this. Having the right attitude about ourselves will enable us not only to fit in, but to have more insight into the church. And that's in verses 4 and 5. He says, For each, just as each of us has one body. How many of y'all have a body? Let me see your hand. Everybody got a body? Okay. This analogy works for everybody. You've got a body. Everybody in the church has a body. You've got eyes, ears, noses, hands, feet, so forth. You're part of the body, the church. Verse 5 says, So in Christ... We who are many form one body. Now, he's not talking about the Roman church, like, you know, the church Bible center Luling. He's not talking about it because when he's writing to Rome, he's writing to all the Christians in Rome, no matter where there they are. And he's talking about the church, the universal church, the, all those who believe in whom the Holy Spirit has placed into this one body. We're part of the body of Christ. When you trust Christ as Savior, you become part of His body. You are literally His hands and feet on the earth. And as a member of Christ's body, He goes on to say, you're connected to everybody else who's in the body. And each member, verse 5, belongs to all the others. Belongs to all the others. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. You have a responsibility for other people. You have a responsibility. Just like when you have a body, and we were talking with Denise about her shoulder hurting. I said, well, does your right hand ever sneak up there and rub your shoulder? Why? Why would your right right arm's not hurt? Why would the right hand sneak up there and rub that shoulder? Same body. You see, when we recognize we're in the same body, we recognize I have a responsibility to minister to other people. Next week, it may be the right shoulder that hurts. You know what the left hand will probably do? Say, well, it's not my business. You know, I'm, I got my own trouble. Hurts over here. You know, what he'll be doing is like this, right? You know why? Because it's one body. We have to recognize that we are needed. And we also all have needs from the body. Kind of like in the Navy, they ask a guy, he was coming before Cormier. He said, look, I need you to wash your hands. He said, both of them? He said, no, wash one. I'd like to see how you do it. Think about it. It takes both hands to, to wash your hands and get it really good. I mean, it just, we need one another. Uh, but while we're members of one body, we don't all do exactly the same thing. We have different gifts. Verse 6, we have different gifts. Wow, you wonder where I get this stuff? It's right there. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. Not according to the faith given to each of us, but according to the grace given to each of us. We have different gifts. God made us different. Aren't you glad we don't all look alike? Aren't you glad you don't look like me? You would look funny, wouldn't you? It would be really funny if everybody looked like me. It would be kind of like, whoa, am I having one of those hallucinations here? Everybody out here looks like, no, everybody looks different. I can see everybody different. Everybody's got different abilities. We need to recognize and enjoy the differences. Here's a little story I enjoy. It's called The Animal School, a fable. Once upon a time, the animals decided they must do something heroic to meet the problems of the new world, so they organized a school. They adopted an activity curriculum which consisted of running, climbing, swimming, and flying. 
Makes sense. But to make it easier to administer the curriculum, all the animals took the same course, same subjects. The duck was excellent in swimming. In fact, he was better than his instructor. But he only made passing grades in flying and was very poor in running. Since he was so slow in running, he had to stay after school and also drop swimming in order to practice running. They kept up the practice until his webbed feet were so badly worn that he was only average in swimming, but average was acceptable in the school and nobody worried about it except the duck. The rabbit started at the top of his class in running, but he had a nervous breakdown because he had so much makeup work in swimming. The squirrel was excellent in climbing until he developed frustration in the flying class where his teacher made him start from the ground up instead of from the treetop down. He also developed a charley horse from overexertion and got a C in climbing and a D in running. The eagle was a problem child. In climbing class, he beat all the others to the top of the tree but he insisted on using his own way to get there. We have different gifts. We need to develop them according to our gifts. You're different people. Now, the seven gifts that Paul lists here are out of maybe 19 that we can find mentioned in the New Testament. I want us to look at these seven gifts, recognizing that we can learn from what somebody else's gift is, and we can learn from what is said about that gift. For instance, if you have the gift, he says, of prophecy. Suppose somebody has the gift of prophesying or prophecy. Uh, what is prophecy? Well, it's the ability to speak for God, usually about some future event or course of action. In the early decades of the church, prophets were highly valued in the church. They not only foretold what was going to happen, such as the famine that came, uh, or the arrest of Paul in Jerusalem. Same prophet foretold both of those. But they also spoke in ways that comforted and encouraged people in the church. And because so many people had this gift, and because false prophets were around, the people were encouraged in 1 Corinthians 14 to evaluate what the prophets said. Judge whether it is measured correctly. What's the measure? Well, prophesy in accordance with your faith. Prophesy in accordance with your faith. Remembering your salvation, your gift comes from God. Prophesy in accordance with the faith. That's the Christian use of your gift. Now you can learn things from secular sources about how to do things. But you have to recognize that I'm going to have to minister according to the Christian way this gift ought to be used. Whatever it is, whether it's prophecy or whatever else that he's talking about. Why are there no prophets today? Well, on the one hand, there are plenty of prophets around. You ever watch television? There's plenty of people claiming to be prophets. But there are few who meet the test of a prophet. And I don't have time to go into all of that, but you go back to Deuteronomy and you look up this word prophet and search through the scriptures, you'll find there's a lot of things said about a prophet, uh, about who he had to be, what kind of person he had to be. Uh, he had to have his short-term predictions come true. It was no good having a prophet that said, you know, 200 years from now, this is going to take place. If you want to know whether a prophet was verified, one, you had to have him, he had to give some short-term prophecy that came true that you could check out in, in the near term, was that true, what he said, predicted? If he didn't, if what he said didn't come true, Deuteronomy says, don't worry about that when God didn't send him. Just ignore it. It don't matter how impressive he is. If he's wrong, if he predicts something that's going to happen and it doesn't happen, ignore him. Jesus was accused of being a prophet. He said, I'll give you a sign. You want a sign? I'll give you a sign. Destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it back up again. Now, if you can pull that off, okay, you're a prophet. You're speaking for God. The other thing was that a prophet, when he spoke, 
had to speak in accordance with the faith, that is, with the analogy of the faith, with what all of the scriptures teach, with what God has been showing in the scriptures. If a prophet contradicts the teachings of God, for instance, if a prophet says, well, you know, this whole thing about the God of Israel, well, you know, there's all kinds of gods. And this other God over here is just as powerful as the God of Israel. You know what you know about that prophet? He's a false prophet. He's not speaking for God. He's speaking false prophet. Even if he could do a miracle, even if he could show you some sign in the heavens, so don't, don't buy into that. He's wrong because he's not speaking for God. When you're using the gift of prophecy in those days, you had to be evaluated by the other prophets. That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14. You read 1 Corinthians 14 and you'll see, hey, we need to be sure that we're using it correctly. Make sure that whatever gift you have, particularly if you think you've got the gift of prophecy, you better fit in with what the scriptures are saying. And you better be accurate about that. Now there's three other gifts mentioned. Serving, teaching, and encouraging. He says, verse 7, if it's serving, how do you use the gift of service? Of what? Serve. If your gift is teaching, you should teach. If it's encouraging, you should Encourage. Hey, man, this isn't rocket surgery or brain science. I mean, it's really simple, isn't it? I mean, some, some gifts are obvious. There's a logical use for your gift. If God has given you this ability, then what does he want you to do? That. Use it that way. If God has given you skill, God has given you ability, use that ability to serve the Lord. Make good use of that. Well, what about if it's giving, aren't you glad you don't have the gift of giving? The other people must have it, you don't have it, so you don't have to give, right? No, that's not what he's saying. He says here, if you have the gift of giving, if it is contributing, it says here, to the needs of others, let him give generously. Now, from this we learn this about spiritual gifts. Not just that if you have the gift of giving, you ought to give generously, but the idea is I can learn from people who are gifted by God how to do what they do. Every believer is supposed to give, right? According to your abilities. Give in accordance, give cheerfully, was the verse we read. Not begrudgingly, but give cheerfully. That is, be hilarious in giving. I, a friend of mine that has a gift of giving, he said, you know, I get the same joy that you get out of preaching, out of giving. Same way you feel preaching? He said, that's the way I feel when I give. Well, okay, that taught me something about giving. We need to recognize that I can learn how to teach from a teacher, even if I don't have the gift to teach. I can learn how to encourage by being around somebody that's encouraging. Dear Lord knows, some of us need to hang around people that know how to show mercy, right? So we can figure out how do you do this? How do you learn? What do you say? No, we can learn from one another. Generously, we ought to share not only the gift, but also how you use the gift. You want to learn to evangelize? You know what you need to do? Hang around somebody that knows how to share the gospel, how to interact with people. Knows how to do that. Hang out with it. The best way to learn that is to go out with somebody that does it. And just watch. Watch and learn. Watch how they do it. And you'll say, Really? That's all you do? I could do that. There you go. That's the point. Not a person in this room that couldn't give. Not a person in this room that couldn't give generously if you sat down and thought about the compassions of God. Right? You'd say, man, let me give as generously as I can. We can learn from others. If we have a gift, then use that gift to, to encourage others to strengthen others. Let's say you have the gift to lead. You ought to do it, it says here, diligently, or govern diligently. Exercise that gift diligently. If you know anything about leadership, you know neglect is not the key to leadership. If you don't organize things, it won't happen. I think it's the, the, the topic is called entropy. It's the concept that if you leave 
your desk alone and you never organize it, you get piles of paper here and paper there and paper here and this over there. We had one doctor in Virginia that he was that, that was his filing system. He knew which pile and about how far. If you were looking for a chart, he could go down there and say, it's about right here. That's not leadership. It works for him. It would be lousy for everybody else. I would not want a guy like that in charge of the files for everybody in the whole, whole group. There's a better system. But no system works unless you work it. You've got to do it. You've got to be diligently. It doesn't happen. Look at Moses' job of leading the people after they came out of Egypt. Go back and read what Jer Jethro, his father-in-law, told him. You know, listen to your father-in-law. He might have some good advice. In this case, he did. He said, you know, you're going to wear yourself and the people out. You need to divide them up in groups and find men who are qualified, capable, mature people and put them over groups and groups and groups so that you've got a hierarchy. You've got a judicial system. You've got a system of people that, that you know, 10 people can say, let's talk to our leader. And if he doesn't know what to do, then he can talk to a guy that's leading 100 if the, between them they can't figure it out, then they can go to a guy leading a thousand. If they can't figure out, the three of them, what God wants us to do, then come to Moses, and Moses will ask the Lord, and we'll find out what to do. He set up a system. And when you set up that system, and everybody did their job diligently, you know what happened? The line stopped. And Moses wasn't sitting there from morning to evening trying to solve every problem. It was sharing out and distributing that ministry, you are needed. Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter how old or how young you are. You are needed in the church. The reason why you're here is because you're bringing something that we need. We need you. But you need us. One of the great lessons of leadership that you really should learn is you can't lead without people, right? If you're the only one, we don't call that leadership. You need other people. Every one of us at times need other people. There are people you don't need when you need mercy to be shown to you. You need somebody else in the body to come alongside and show you mercy. There are some people that are good at showing mercy they're not real good at teaching. There are some people that are good at teaching that aren't very encouraging. There are some others that are really good at encouraging. And, you know, you can be a preacher and a teacher. You can be a preacher and an encourager. You can be a preacher and a prophet. They had all of those. And they were different. People that are given prophecy weren't teaching not like the people that were teaching, and the people that were encouraging like Barnabas, he was an encourager, but he wasn't a teacher. What's the first thing he did when he saw the need in Antioch? He said, let me go find Paul. Paul's a teacher. And between this encourager, Barnabas, son of encouragement, that's what his nickname, that was his nickname. Between this encourager, Joseph Barnabas, and Saul Paulus, we got a good combination here. We got an encourager. Man, he can encourage everybody, and it's really encouraged. And you got a great teacher. You got Paul. He thinks. He really thinks this stuff out. We need to recognize that we all need one another. Now, finally, I come to the seventh gift that he talks about here. And if it's showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. If you think you have the gift of showing mercy... And people are more depressed when you leave than when you came. You're doing it wrong. I'm not saying you don't have the gift of mercy, but you're doing it wrong. You need to get around somebody that when people leave them, they feel comforted. They feel encouraged. They feel like somebody's shown. You know when you need mercy? When you messed up. I don't need mercy when things are going good. When you need mercy is when I've messed up. I messed up. That's when you need mercy. When I'm doing it right, I don't need mercy. I need encouraging maybe, but I don't need somebody to show mercy. It takes a real gift to take somebody that's feeling down in the dumps and say, look, you know, you're just not much of a quarterback. 
That's, you got to recognize that. That's not mercy. You got to come alongside and you got to be cheery. Now, we're not talking about, oh, it's going to be good. It's going to work out. Everything's going to be good. You know, those, those, well, you're not supposed to slap anybody, but you kind of want to, don't you? That you said, wake up. We just lost the game. We got trump. Well, no, you need a coach that's going to come along and say, look, you know, it's okay. We can work on it. You can do that. You know, you did great here. And yeah, you messed up here. I'm sorry you dropped that phone. We'll work on it. You know, but it's going to work. You need to hang around people that have the gift of showing mercy so you can learn that. So you can learn from them, this is how you do that. Sometimes you just need to call them. You know, have them on speed dial. Hey, I need you to talk to so-and-so because they really messed up and they need somebody besides me. Because I'm trying to solve their problem, tell them, well, here's what Scripture says, do this, 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 and this, and this will work out. That's not mercy, is it? That's teaching. That's instructing. Sometimes you just need somebody to come along and hug you and say, you know, I remember when I messed up like that. I remember when that happened to me. Let me tell you about that. So I kind of I kind of know a little bit about what you're going through. That's more mercy. That's more somebody can encourage you and show you mercy. Every one of us needs mercy. Needed mercy and still needs mercy. 